Hello and welcome to this webinar. We are delighted to have Dr. Uh, Mathilde Barbeau with us today. Dr. Mathilde Barbeau is originally from the south shore of Quebec City, where she grew up. After completing a bachelor's degree in psychology at Université Laval, she went on to complete her doctorate in a family medicine at Université de Montréal. She returned to work in Lévis in 2001. She first worked in a CHSLD and then in a physical disability rehabilitation center, then joined a family medicine group, FMG, where she still practices as a family physician. She is also a physician evaluator at Retraite Québec. In her spare time, she enjoys walking outdoors with her friends and adapted downhill skiing, also called by skiing. So now to you, Dr. Barbeau. So we will start. I have no conflicts of interest to uh, declare. So today we will be reviewing some healthy uh, habits we should be uh, having. We will also look at screening of high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, and diabetes. We will talk a little bit about uh, screening of uh, TSIs, sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. We will talk a bit about screening of certain types of cancers. We will also talk about neuro neurogenic bladder and also a urologic uh, follow-up for women with spina bifida. We'll talk a little bit about a pregnancy follow-up and folic acid and how we can prevent uh, osteoporosis. We will start with uh, good health habits. Uh, Eating well is uh, something that's recommended. Now we recommend uh, to eat a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. We used to talk about five portions a day, but now we took this away and we talk about eating as much as possible of uh, fruits and uh, vegetables, as much as we want. We also want to favor whole grains uh, food. It can be uh, quinoa, oat, whole wheat bread or whole grain bread. And to also eat protein at each meal. It can be uh, legumes, uh, peanut butter, uh, eggs, uh, milk, tofu, uh, fish or poultry. As far as physical exercise is concerned, we recommend, recommend to integrate each week about 150 minutes a week that we can split up in uh, 30 minutes uh, a day, five days a week. But of course, if people feel, oh, this is really a lot for me, I don't do a lot of uh, physical activity right now or not at all, it's nice to start with 10 minutes once or twice a week and then we see how we tolerate it and how we feel when we go uh, outside, uh, if it's in the winter and it's a little bit more difficult, we can uh, even take our uh, wheelchair and go to the, if we are in a wheelchair and go to a shopping center. There were walking uh, clubs during the, uh, but before, but with the pandemic, they've come to a hold. But you can do, you can go by yourself or sometimes when we go with friends, it's motivating and it encourages us uh, to move uh, when we are uh, in company of friends. So you can start uh, 10 minutes once or twice a week and we see things are going well. So the week after we can go 15 minutes, two, three times a week until we uh, get to do a longer uh, physical activity. Of course, if we go over 30 minutes, it's not a problem at all. If you do cross country or downhill skiing or skating or swimming, uh, then if you go for an hour, that's great. Let's continue. Of course, tobacco and drugs are not recommended. As far as tobacco, there is no uh, minimum or, or amount of uh, uh, cigarettes that's safe uh, to uh, smoke uh, each uh, day because it can lead to uh, lung cancers or uh, uh, throat cancer or even bladder cancer that's a little less uh, frequent. As far as drugs, uh, be, them, uh, be they soft or hard, I don't recommend them. And if someone feels maybe they have problems with uh, drugs or they want to stop smoking, 
Then there are pharmacists who are uh, specialists uh, in this stop in helping with uh, uh, stopping uh, to smoke, and there are also uh, readaptation centers on addiction that can help you if you have any problems with that, or you can talk to your nurse or a practitioner. As far as alcohol is concerned, what is recommended for a woman? is to have a maximum of 10 unities a week and a maximum of two a day. Occasionally, we can have four or five uh, during one day, but that's not recommended on a regular basis. What does one unit of alcohol mean? If we have really large uh, wine glasses and we fill them up, then it's definitely more than one unit. As far as one uh, unit of uh, uh, Wine, it's half a cup or 140 milliliters of uh, wine. For a beer, we talk about a small uh, can, it's about 340 milliliters and one and a half ounce of, ounce of uh, stronger alcohol. Now we will talk about the screening of uh, uh, diseases that uh, may present some risk on the for the heart. This is quite medical, what I'm going to talk to you about now. Some aspects will be a little bit heavier, perhaps, and maybe less interesting for you. And please do not hesitate at the end. If ever you have any questions and you want uh, me to clarify something, let me know. As far as the uh, screening of diabetes, we now do it with the find risk form. This is what it looks like your nurse practitioner or your uh, MD can help you and may have some forms uh, at their office. And you can also actually download it on the internet and get it there. There are several questions uh, on the form. It starts with the age. Uh, does the person uh, uh, eat f fresh fruits and vegetables? And according to the score, you get then uh, recommendations as far as screening uh, are given. If a woman has a very high score and is very high, very high risk, then we recommend to do a screening once a year. Also, women who have done, uh, uh, who have had uh, gestational diabetes, uh, meaning during pregnancy, or if they have high blood pressure or if, if they are of uh, indigenous origin, then they should be doing screening and doing a test every year. So women who have a more moderate or, or low risk, but who are more than 40 years old, we recommend then screening every three and five years of three to five years. And all the adults who are, uh, uh, who have a high risk, who are at high risk, whatever the age, we recommend the screening be done uh, every, uh, between three and five years. So now let's talk about screening with uh, cholesterol, which we call the sleep epidemia. It is recommended in adults between the age of 40 to 75 years old, every five years. Sometimes we do it at the same time as the screening for diabetes. And this screening is not for people that, for who we know have cardiovascular issues, who have already had uh, illnesses or amputations related to this for artery uh, blockages, for example. For these people, they should already be following a treatment, so they, we don't have screening. Screening is uh, for people between 40 to 75 years old who have not had issues. If a woman is under the age of 40 but has risk factors for cardiovascular diseases, we can do a screening before the age of 40. Uh, these are examples of risk factors. AF means family history of chol high cholesterol. Family history, high family history of heart disease. For example, if your mother had angina 
or other heart issues before the age of 65 and the father before the age of 55. If the person has hypertension, kidney failure, if the woman had her menopause before the age of 40, so precocious menopause, if they are a smoker, if they have diabetes, if they have abnormal obesity with a waist or conference above 80 centimeters, it might be useful to do the screening before the age of 40. Now for the screening of high blood pressure or hypertension. So these are synonyms. If for, it's for all adults over the age of 18. And today I'm talking, not talking about screening for children and teens because there are different uh, recommendations for these populations. So uh, we're talking here about uh, adult women who have spina bifida or hydrocephalus. So screening for this every year uh, when you visit uh, your family doctor or nurse practitioner. If a woman with uh, spina bifida or hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus that has dilated kidney, you see that sometimes with neurogenic bladders. So it's important to do this screening for high blood pressure. So remember to ask your doctor when you see them, but you can also do it at the pharmacy. Uh, they have uh, tensiometers, uh, machines that uh, measure this. During the pandemic, a lot of pharmacies did not offer the service, but they should start doing again. So please, um, ask when you go to a pharmacy if you don't have a tensiometer at home. If you are close to hypertension, it might be useful to go see a clinic. And if uh, the indicator is in the red, uh, you should really go without waiting. So what are the normal blood pressure values for an adult? If you have a home blood pressure monitor, the tensiometer, you have to measure it on your arm, not on your wrist. And the normal value is 135 over 85 at a minimum. If you are in the pharmacy, same thing. If you're at the office of an MD, and they have a, st a stethoscope on them, it would have to be 140 over 90. However, if it's measured where with an oscillometric tensiometer in series, it would be the norm, the normal one would be under 135 over 85. You don't do a diagnosis with only one reading. You have to do more than one reading to have this diagnosis of hypertension. And measuring it at home with a tensiometer, uh, you have to do it morning and night for one week. That is as valuable as doing five with an osseometric tensiometer in series in a clinic. So if you've measured it at home, you write it down and you bring it when you uh, go visit your doctor. Now a word on the screening of sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne infections. So here's a list that is non-exhaustive. So there's other uh, ways to screen. Someone can go for their screening even if uh, they don't have any of these factors going on. We will never refuse a person. So a 
person who is sexually active over the age of 18 can ask for one if they have a new partner before having uh, sex with them, the both should do the test. If you've never had sex there, you don't need to do it. But if you have a new partner and you've previously had unprotected sexual encounters with one or more partners, you should do this screenings for STIs. So pregnant women, even if they're in a monogamous relationship, at the beginning of the pregnancy, it's a useful thing to do. Injection or intranasal drug users, even if they've only done it once, it is a recognized risk factor. So don't hesitate to ask for a screening. People who have pursi pursings or tattoos that were done with non-sterile uh, material should be screened. People who've received a blood or other blood product transfusions can also ask for a screening. Uh, some may have received even a letter from the government uh inviting them to go for a screening if they had a transfusion between a, a certain year and another year and don't hesitate to ask your doctor ever if you think you may be at risk some stis like hiv syphilis hepatitis c will be tested with a blood test and other like gonorrhea, chlamydia will be with a urine test or on the cervix for women. And we can do it at the same time as the gynecological cytology. So don't hesitate to ask for the screening if you want one. Now let's talk about the screening of some cancers not all cancers can be screened these are the four types of screenings that are available in quebec for women so there's cervical cancer breast cancer colorectal cancer uh, of uh, the large intestines and rectum so the piece that is right above the uh, uh, anus and lung cancer uh, that we started screening recently. So when we talk about cancer screening, it's done in asymptomatic adults or no symptoms of concern. For example, someone who's uh, uh, coughing of a blood, it wouldn't be just a screening. So it's never mandatory and there are advantages and disadvantages to doing a screening as we will see but quickly the advantages of screening a cancer early would be that maybe we'll find the cancer when it is smaller treatable um, easy to operate and we can increase the chances of survival of this person. The disadvantages is to save lives, a lot of lives. There will be a lot of screening, so it can be stressful, a lot of waiting. There's more tests to do if uh, the first one is abnormal. So for cervical cancer screening, it's offered to any woman in Quebec, who's aged between 21 and 65, who is sexually active who, or who have been sexually active in the past. It's done every two to three years with a pap test or a gynecological cytology. It's done on the uterine cervix. However, if the woman has ever had an abnormal result, maybe their doctor 
we'll ask them to do it every six months or every year for a certain period of time. A word on vaccination. The vaccine against uh, HPV, so human papilloma virus, that is a risk for uh, uterine cancer is available. So this virus can be caught during uh, sexual relationships and you may not know that you're a carrier. So getting vaccinated reduces the risk of very much of developing this cancer and condylomas as well. So there are a couple of different vaccines for this available in Quebec. It's part of the Quebec vaccination program. It will be free uh, soon for people under the age of 18, for others under the age of 26, but it can be offered to women up to the age of 45. But uh, in this case, it won't be free. Uh, the woman will have to pay uh, to receive the vaccine. There are some doctors that even offer it over the age of 45. It can be interesting for women who was with the same partner for a long time, but there's a separation and they have a new partner. There's uh, uh, more risk of uh, getting HPV. So don't hesitate to discuss this with your doctor. There are also uh, nurses who are very good at uh, a vaccination in GMFs or CLSCs, don't hesitate to ask some questions. Now a word on breast cancer screening. The Quebec program on breast cancer screening is offered to all women aged between 50 and 69 years of age. They will receive a letter from the government inviting them to do a mammogram every two years. You can also do it for women aged between 70 and 74 every two years, but here you would need a medical prescription. Know that, uh, so it's a, uh, an exam in radiology that you need to do an appointment for, take an appointment. So you receive the letter, you call where there are mammograms, they take an appointment. However, if there are uh, incidences as of breast cancer in the family, you t should talk to your doctor because there is a possibility of early screening uh, relating to the age of the youngest case that there was in your family. And if there are symptoms such as a lump on the breast, if there is a discharge or bleeding on the nipple or near it, that is not going away, that it lasts a certain time. We won't just do screening. There is something abnormal going on. So do not hesitate to talk about it with your healthcare provider. Don't wait for the government letter, talk about it. And so the doctor can prescribe a mammogram after examining you. So why do we do the screening of breast cancer? What uh, studies have shown is that it reduces the risk of uh, going through chemotherapy if we discover a cancer, because this sooner, uh, because if we uh, detect it soon, then uh, this it's at a um, less advanced stage and it reduces the risk of dying as well and we saw that out of 1000 women who were um, screened we uh, seven uh, breast cancer deaths would be prevented but the, there are some inconvenience in screening screening stress when we're waiting for the results also we have false positives uh, so these are uh, mammograms that are not normal, but we don't find any cancer there. 
So this is close to 300 out of 1,000 cases that are uh, screened. Biopsy, what is a biopsy? Is we take a sample? Generally, if a mammogram is not normal, the radiologist will uh, want to uh, find some uh, uh, extended tissues and we'll see if there are some lesions that might uh, uh, orient towards uh, breast cancer. So there might be a recommendation to take a sample within the breast to analyze it and see if it's cancer or not. So this is what a biopsy is, and it's taking a sample. And we, uh, we've we seen that 37 uh, out of 1,000 uh, biopsies are, uh, well, we write uh, not uh, useful, but uh, I write not useful, but it's not really not useful because if there isn't, if there is one, well, good thing we found it, right? And another uh, inconvenient is over uh, diagnosis. Some, some women who might have one, but would never uh, develop it uh, or, uh, or die because of it. A word on screening of uh, colorectal cancer, it's colon and rectum cancer. It's recommended for adults between age of 50 to 74. How do we do this? We do this with uh, what we call a fit test, uh, where we search for occult uh, blood, that means invisible blood in the stool. So we indicate and uh, recommend this every uh, two years. And if someone doesn't have any uh, symptoms, uh, but if you have uh, neurogenic problems, you can, uh, if you have a neurogenic bladder, you can have a, a screening. But if there's some change, uh, blood in the stool, uh, change in the frequency of stools with regards to uh, what used to be uh, before and our uh, prior habits. So if our uh, stool are really, really very, very thin, like a pen, then it's not screening, it's something serious and we need to uh, ask to see the, the, the MD and then he or they can do a, an exam. So for someone who has no uh, symptom, we're looking for occult uh, uh, blood. If the test comes out positive, meaning they do find very small amounts of blood in stool, then they will refer the person to a, a colonoscopy. What is this is we put a small camera in the large intestine and colon. A small note here, if there are family, there is family history of uh, a colorectal uh, cancer or polyposis, family polyposis or there have been a polyps in the large intestine, uh, then tissues can be different and the gastroenterologist or the MD can uh, recommend that the next uh, colonoscopy will be in three or five uh, years. So they will recommend with regards to the uh, first case of uh, colorectal cancer in the family. What are the advantages of uh, screening as someone who has no symptoms? We uh, increase the chances that if there is cancer, we find it at a very, very early stage. And this way, it's more, uh, much more easier to treat it. And someone who uh, does a fit test, we see that there are, uh, we could uh, actually uh, prevent five uh, deaths uh, uh, out of uh, 1,000 people screened. As far as the uh, screening of the lung cancer, this is being uh, organized uh, all over Quebec. It's indicated for adults from age 55 to 74 who smoke or stop uh, smoking since less than 15 years. And it, this person needs to have smoked uh, for at least 20 years 
uh, what does that mean to have smoked for 20 years? Actually, we calculate all the years that the person was smoking and we uh, remove uh, the person's uh, the, 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 the periods where the person stopped smoking if that happened. That doesn't mean it's not dangerous anymore to uh, smoke. As I was saying earlier, no quantity of, uh, of cigarettes is uh, uh, harmless and uh, any person, uh, each cigarette can be uh, harmful. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, cancer, lung cancer is uh, very lethal and a lot of people die from it. And with the screening, we want to uh, uh, detect the cancer when it's small and treatable in very early stage. How do we do this? We do this with the uh, uh, low dose uh, CD scan and can be prescribed by a doctor or a specialized nurse. So if ever you smoke, don't hesitate to talk about it uh, when you meet your MD and as far as uh, patches are concerned. If people want to try uh, to stop smoking, I encourage it, of course. So they can uh, help you uh, decide, uh, evaluate if they see, if you see uh, uh, how they see how many uh, cigarettes you smoke uh, every day. So before. We've done some uh, uh, screening and we could see that out of 1,000 1, people who were screened, 52 cases uh, were found. And out of the 26, uh, actually 26 were found early enough uh, that we could heal and operate. And we could also uh, avoid or prevent eight deaths. We will talk about neurogenic bladder. It's a very frequent uh, uh, condition for women with spina bifida. A little bit of uh, uh, recall here. It's important to do a follow-up, uh, urological fo follow-up to preserve health of uh, kidneys and, and bladder. Sometimes I see people who went for 10 to 15 years without doing follow-ups of their uh, uh, bladder or urologic uh, follow-up. And uh, I find it's too bad because even if you feel everything is going well, it's better to do a follow-up. And how do we do this uh, follow-up? We do it with the urologist, of course, but also with blood tests to, be, to check the, uh, how the uh, kidneys are working. The urological uh, follow-up is uh, recommended minimally every three years with an ultrasound of the uh, kidneys. It can be uh, prescribed by the nurse practitioner or the uh, MD. Maybe the urologist is gonna say, I prefer seeing you every year, or if the person has had a Botox injection in the uh, bladder, then uh, follow-up can be done every uh, few months. Uh, most of you have probably uh, done uh, these tests and these follow-up. The follow-up, uh, uh, urological follow-up can uh, comprise urodynamic assessment. We look if the person can uh, uh, empty uh, their bladder by themselves. Uh, is, if not, we can uh, uh, see how we can help to uh, uh, the person to empty the bladder. Also, the urodynamic assessment can include cystoscopy. This is a camera in the bladder, so it allows to go and see what happen what is happening inside the bladder. And as I was saying earlier, the ultrasound of the kidneys. Uh, and the bladder, what we call the urinary tree. When the bladder does not empty naturally or spontaneously, then we could uh, uh, do bladder catheterization. 
since uh, most women who have a neurogenic bladder uh, who, who need a bladder catheterization can do them the, do it themselves. Uh, if it's difficult, then it can be uh, installed sometimes with kids that, uh, well, with kids, parents are going to do it. If ever there are urinary leakage uh, because of uninhibited contractions, if the bladder, while it's uh, uh, filling up, uh, sometimes it contracts and there are uh, leakage, uh, there are solutions for this. We can use medication that calm the bladder. There's the detrol, le mitoril. There are different uh, uh, medications and other companies uh, produce them as well. If you have uh, side effects, sometimes uh, it can uh, constipate or uh, bring uh, dryness in the mouth. So dryness uh, in the mouth, constipation. If this is your case, uh, don't hesitate to talk about it with the person who prescribed it because you might find alternatives with less side effects. If we don't use uh, medication, uh, we can also uh, do intravesical uh, Botox injection done by the urologist. And the women can use uh, protections, but the first two options are more interesting and most of the time it gives good results. If a woman, of course, we see there are a lot of uh, urinary infections uh, uh, among women uh, or for women who have neurogenic bladder. If a woman has a urinary infection, is it a, is it dangerous to transmit it to uh, their partner during the uh, sexual relation? No. Actually, the sexual relation is a risk factor to develop a urinary uh, infection, but this is not how it is transmitted. And if this person, maybe you've heard about this, you might have heard of bacterias, uh, urine symptomatic uh, bacterias they're present in the bladder but there are no there is no infection then we don't need to, to uh, uh, use antibiotics in this case is it difficult is it dangerous to transmit it to our partner no so we don't worry about it if you are at risk of having UTIs how can you minimize the risks? Uh, after having sex, a few tips. So it would be to urinate after sex, uh, staying well hydrated after sex, not too much before if uh, you want to minimize the risk of leakage. So if you hydrate well and urinate a few hours later, that's fine. But if you have urine leakage, you should avoid drinking two hours before uh, sex to uh, decrease the risk of leakage. It's possible also of taking an antibiotic within an hour before sex. You'll say, well, that decreases spontaneity. Of course, you're, you're right. It's not always possible to plan this. If ever you have this prescribed antibiotic and then take it before, you can take it right after. There's a new product called UTVI, two tablets of 35, 36 milligrams. What's recommended is two tablets right before or right after sex. Uh, if, if you have sex many times in a day, you only take it twice uh, in a day. It's two max per day. And then you can take two the next day. Unfortunately, RAMQ does not cover UTVA. If you have private insurance and you have a prescription, you can check if your insurance covers it. It's not the case for all insurance plans. A few words now on pregnancy and spina bifida. Uh, 
Spina bifida does not affect the fertility of the affected women uh, generally or a woman with hydrocephalus. So the woman who has spina bifida, uh, if they have uh, unprotected sex with a fertile man, they can get pregnant. So if she does not to, uh, want to get pregnant, she needs to use contraception. So it can be a condom, uh, the pill, or ibuprofen injection. There are many types of uh, contraceptions nowadays. It could be interesting to talk about this with your doctor to see what uh, is best for you. About oral contraceptives, the usual ones that contain estrogen and progesterone can increase the risk of thrombophlebitis in the leg, so a blood clot. If uh, you don't feel your legs, if your legs don't move, you are more at risk of uh, ha getting this. So if you take this type of birth control, maybe it would be best to use another kind. And about condoms, if you are allergic to latex or if your partner is allergic to latex, choose a latex free condom. They exist. 30 years ago, it was condoms that were of, uh, made with natural uh, lambskin. Now that's not what they are anymore. It's really a type of condom that are uh, can prevent STIs that are made without latex. So read uh, on the package if you're not sure uh, or ask the pharmacist if you have questions. So a reminder, if you take oral contraceptives or ibuprofen or other contraception that is not condoms, that does not prevent uh, blood-borne STIs. You really need to add a barrier method such as a condom, no matter the age of the person. If you are planning a pregnancy, I encourage you to discuss this with your doctor, your urologist maybe. Sometimes there are references in GARE clinics, which means uh, high risk uh, pregnancies. It's not to discourage women with spina bifida to have uh, children, quite the contrary. There are many beautiful examples of women who had children. Often when the referral is done, when the woman is trying to get pregnant or is pregnant, uh, you can go see uh, a doctor. There are many in uh, St. Justin, Chaudière-Appalaches. I don't know all the hospitals in Quebec. I I'm sure there are some elsewhere in Sherbrooke, for example. So there will be a meeting before the Frank woman is pregnant and then after she is pregnant. For women with spina bifida to reduce risks of having a child who also has a spina bifida or hydrocephalus, it is recommended to take five milligrams of folic acid per day and to start doing this at least three months before uh, you get pregnant. So this means, uh, for example, a woman who has a diaphragm as uh, she uses that as birth control. So this is inside the uterus. So before getting it removed, she should start taking folic acid three months before. So I, I, IUD, uh, before removing the IUD, and then she continues taking folic acid uh, during conception and while she's pregnant because the neural tube, uh, so spina bifida is an anomaly of the neural tube on the fetus. This is formed 
we we used to say in the first three weeks of pregnancy now we say in the first 28 days of pregnancy so sometimes before the woman even knows she is pregnant so you have to start taking this at least three months before you get pregnant so we'll end with this screening of osteoporosis an illness that is often uh, more prevalent uh, with older women so the screening is recommended for adults over the age of 50 with a bone densitometry test. You don't have to do it every year. Uh, the doctor does a survey to see if it's worth it at your age to do it because you can wait until the age of 60 if there are no risk factors or family history. So people who don't uh, walk, if they use a wheelchair, you can you have osteoporosis from non-use. It can start from the teen years. So the bone density won't uh, be as uh, uh, dense because you don't use it. So people who walk, the treatment for them is different. I won't go into detail, but the prevention is the same for everyone. This is a standard uh, approach to prevention. So for adults, and particularly for women, we recommend taking 1,000 units per day of vitamin D. So you can buy it anywhere or get a prescription as well for children uh, it's it's less don't give this much to children you have to eat dairy for calcium two or three portions per day are recommended if you don't eat that uh, you have to take templates you have to do physical activity with weight bearing on the feet if possible so you can walk, snowshoe, ski, and you'll say, well, what if I swim or bike? Uh, so it won't necessarily prevent osteoporosis, but of course it's always useful to do a physical activity. It's great for your uh, heart. So, of course, uh, that is recommended as well. But to prevent osteoporosis, you have to do physical activity with weight bearing on the feet. So recommended daily amount of calcium for women from the age of 19 to 50 is 1000 milligrams a day. And if you are over 50, it's 1200 milligrams a day you'll say well that's complicated how do i calculate how much i get you can go on the osteoporosis canada website uh, i'll give you examples here with the help of miss isabelle Cote, who's a nutritionist so 250 milliliters of milk or one cup that's about 300 milligrams of calcium same for a cup of fortified soy beverage so 300 milligrams one yogurt of 100 grams so be careful sometimes a, a small yogurt is 75 grams but the bigger ones are between 100 250 milligram a piece of hard cheese of cheddar for example has uh, 200 to 245 milligrams so 50 grams of cheese has this much uh, soft cheeses have a bit less calcium cottage cheese even less however if for you, it's the only kind of cheese you like, cottage cheese, it's better than nothing. But if you like all types of cheese, you may want to increase uh, your um, use of harder cheeses. So half a cup of almonds has 200 milligrams, one medium orange has 50 milligrams, half a cup of cooked 
broccoli, 33 milligram. Sesame seeds has a lot of calcium. So 15 milliliters, that is just a tablespoon, has 94 milligrams. So thank you for your attention. Here are my references. Uh, thanks again to Isabelle Coté, nutritionist at the University of Laval. A uh, word about the American Association of Spina Bifida. There will be in 2023 um, a symposium at which I will participate if there are updates on the research, uh, I will be there for them. Uh -huh.